Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Craig Cipolla. I'm veteran curator of North American archaeology here at the Royal Ontario Museum, but we're not here to talk about archaeology. I'm joined by two special guests for what promised to be a really great discussion. I'm delighted you could join us today for our curatorial conversation. This is a digital program that explores themes and subjects from the Royal Ontario Museum collections alongside industry professionals. We'll have some time for audience questions at the end of the program. So we're gonna talk for about 20 minutes and I encourage you to submit your thoughts through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So first and foremost, we acknowledge that the Royal Ontario Museum sits on the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anish Anishinaabeg Nation, including the Mississauga of the Credit River since time immemorial to today. So for those of you uh, joining us from, from far afield, do recall, do remember, do reflect. If you live on indigenous lands, remember that history, remember those people. Uh, today's program focuses on a project from 2019 where the Royal Ontario Museum uh, updated the interpretation of this thing we call a tree cookie, which is a 2.3 meter cross section of a 500 year old Douglas fir. And this uh, part of the gallery is in our Life in Crisis Shad Gallery of Biodiversity. Now, originally, it was displayed and labeled in the 1920s with events in Western history that occurred as the tree was growing. Uh, this iconic specimen now features interpretation that addresses the problems inherent to this narrative, which is Eurocentric and colonial, and it highlights the cultural significance of these types of trees for indigenous peoples. So we'll talk a little bit about that later, but now I need to talk about my fabulous guests. So our first guest is Stan Wesley. He's a Cree educator who, as we will see, played a vital role in this project that we're about to discuss. For over 30 years, Stan has engaged and entertained audiences with his unique style of presentations, keynotes and everything else. Uh, working at the local, regional, provincial and national levels, he speaks on a variety of issues uh, with a focus on celebrating success and advancing good, healthy relationships among indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. He is considered by many to be one of the top speakers in the country. So we're very lucky to have him today. So welcome, Stan. <clears throat> and next, we have Jennifer Wild, my colleague, Deputy Director of Engagement here at the Royal Ontario Museum. Jennifer joined us in October of 2018. She leads the museum's work on exhibition development, programming, community engagement, and so much more. Prior to joining us at the ROM, she has held all kinds of positions of increasing responsibility at the Detroit Institute for Arts, where she most recently was the Vice President for Learning and audience engagement. As part of her duties at the Royal Ontario Museum, Jennifer oversees the ROMS learning department. And we need to thank the ROMS learning department who played this huge role in, in the project that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, so, so welcome, Jennifer. Uh, in short, as I've already indicated, we're here to discuss and to celebrate this event that took place in 2019 where the ROM officially announced some very important revisions to the tree cookie display. Uh, and in short, Stan, the ROM's learning department and the indigenous advisory circle uh, were essential for these changes. So let's just jump right in. So Stan, could we start with you? Could, we, could you tell us a little bit about your first experience with the original tree cookie and how you, you came to know about it and came to let the ROM know that there were some problems with it? Dinosaurs. That's the first step in my journey is taking my daughter to Nona up to see the dinosaurs. And then once we're all done with the dinosaurs, we go up the ramp and we see the birds and up on the left as we see that cookie cutter. And the first time I saw it, I just felt uneasy about it. I was like, everything, in, in, everything here is all about truth. And this one here is an interpretation, something. I just felt, I just felt uneasy about it. And we just kept going. And then the next trip around, same type of feeling. And I thought to myself, I need to just do something as my dad would say, if I just complain, I'm a part of the problem. Let me try and my best to be a part of the solution. So I think it was my third time. I looked at it and I said, okay, now is the time. Now is the time. Let's do something because this right here is a fabrication of a lie. 
And I thought to myself, my goodness, it's time to take a stand. But I want to take a proactive stand. I don't want to get angry. I want to build a relationship so I can make this right. So I went right into the Canadiana. I was looking for a staff member. <laughs> and once you, you know, when you need them, they're not around, right? They're doing other things. <laughs> <laughs> and then I managed to find somebody, lovely lady. I came, I took her over there and I was just so excited. It's like, here is an opportunity here. We're going to create some change. And I told her, this is wrong, but there's an opportunity to make this right. And I'm like, I know things are slow in this big, huge machine, but I told her, I want to be a part of the solution. I will pay for a revision myself. I was just going on about all the things I wanted to do. But alas, things do take time. And I was just so excited to begin that conversation. I just didn't want to be the guy to walk past it and get mad. I wanted to be the one to walk past it, stop and look at it as a chance to build and foster relationships and begin to understand truth. That's what I'm excited about. And Stan, do you do we want to specifically talk about the the aspects of the original display that 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 triggered this response, or do we not want to get into that detail? Or what do you think? Oh, not at all. Like you know, it's again my daughter going up to see the dinosaurs. So excited to see those dinosaurs for the first time, she ran into the glass, <laughs> just trying to get as close <laughs> as she could. Right? Oh no! She didn't understand that concept. Like oh, you can't get close to the dinosaurs. But I thought of her. And I thought of other children that walk into the beautiful realm and walk past and look at that discovery in 1492 and look at that little section. As uneasy it was for me, it's eventually gonna be uneasy for my daughter and for other people's sons and daughters. And rather than have, rather than not do anything, rather than not do anything, and have her eventually have to deal with that problem that I just avoided and kept walking by. It's just unfair. I know, you know, we all know who discovered these incredible lands. And as you mentioned at the beginning, Craig, one just point of just, just, just wholehearted correction is that we all live on indigenous lands. 100% of people living in North and South America live on indigenous lands. I would say the whole world because everyone's indigenous somewhere at some point in history. Uh, but I just, again, I just wanted to make things right because it just felt like it was wrong for me, but I'm the guy that's a glasses overflowing guy. So I thought, okay, if it's wrong for me, then there's gotta be some right in here somewhere. And the right is that correction to make things right is the education. Uh, that's what it got me excited. And it, 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 and it, and it, it, it gave me an opportunity to meet Jennifer and connect with you. Right. And there's other stories there I want to talk about, but I'm talking way too much right now, but I'm just, it, for me, it was an exciting journey. It was frustrating. It was sad, but yet it was an opportunity. And, 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 and that, and that's where my energy flows right there is the opportunity to make things right. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. So, so, so we've learned uh, how Stan reacted, how he felt about that initial display. So Jennifer, on your side, I know you weren't actually at the ROM yet, and I wasn't involved in this either, but, but I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how the ROM began to react to this and, and, and how it started to take momentum to, to move towards these changes. Sure, sure. Thanks, Craig. And, and thanks, Stan. And I'll, I'll say I'll begin by saying thank you, Stan, for for taking that time, taking the time to say I'm not just going to walk past it, I'm going to engage, I'm going to raise this issue. Um, and then I need to credit um, the learning department and specifically Jeanette Ayakoyakshil, who is our Indigenous um, outreach coordinator in the learning department, who really championed this inside the in the ROM. Yeah, exactly. She's awesome. Um, and, and brought it to our attention. So the, so the learning department saw the way that this tree cookie, this slice of this Douglas fir had been interpreted. And so they worked with the exhibitions department and with Stan and our indigenous advisory circle to say, what is this moment asking us to do? How can we reinterpret um, this artifact so that it tells a, it tells a truth, it tells a greater truth. Um, and so there's this wonderful opportunity, which museums need to do more of, is to open up the interpretation 
from what was a traditional Western perspective, Western um, Eurocentric way of looking at the world and say, no, 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 let's pull back. Let's look at what this object means, what it's really saying. And, and so we created new, or the team created new interpretation, new language that includes the perspective of the indigenous people who lived with the Douglas fir um, uh, in that region, in the Northwest coast. Um, and, and provides their perspective and how they think about this, the, the trees, how they live with the trees, um, how they use the trees, what the trees mean to them. Um, so instead of just being an interpretation that talked from a Western perspective about Western historical moments and, and Western ways of classifying the world and seeing the world, it, it really opened that up and spoke to the fact that that was an untruth on the tree cookie. Um, and uh, provided a new label that allowed people to explore that. So it's, it's one example of what needs to be continually happening in museums. So um, I'll leave it at that, Craig. Sure, and I think I think what uh, that built that's a nice compliment to what Stan was saying about like how we need to work together. We are we're all on indigenous lands, but we can also create a museum where we can have multiple types of knowledge, and we can benefit from knowledge from indigenous people that is incredibly valuable. And I think, you know, uh, uh, we actually have a little video on the ROM website that documents this project where the learning department went out and work with Shishot elders and knowledge keepers from the west coast of Vancouver Island. Those are the peoples, those are, that's where the, the Douglas firs come from. Uh, uh, specifically, they worked with uh, Dale Ross, Willard Gaelic, and Gordon Dick to record more information about this relationality between the people, the place, and the trees. Uh, and, and there's a great video where they document this idea of Ishuk is Awak, if I hope I get that right, which means everything is connected. I can't think of a better message for the world in 2021 for us to start taking that very seriously. Uh, and they learned how the Douglas fir, of course, plays this important role in local ecosystems, but also how it, 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 it when, when Douglas fir trees die, they're used for all different types of fabulous things uh, and, and just get a better contextual feel for what those trees do instead of just taking them out and labeling them with European events. So Stan, or uh, how, how, you know, how does that fit in with, um, with this idea of, of making a museum for everyone? Or, or are there other points you wanted to go back to? I don't know, but, but um, what, what and, and yeah, please go ahead. You know, I, when they had the relaunch uh, last year, a couple of years ago, um, I was excited about it. And I was a little unsure because uh, it took so long, right? And you know, things, things happen and you know, committees and you know, memos and all the other stuff. I was just really happy to get a response. The response came at a slow but steady pace. Uh, and then when the relaunch um, uh, happened, um, uh, somebody came with me and uh, my wife was there. And my friend Ron came with us. And Ron is, um, is a, is a non-First Nation gentleman, uh, born and raised in Quebec. And just in passing, I said, Ron, we're gonna do this thing. And you know, they're gonna relaunch it. They invited me to say a few words. And Ron was saying, you know, I, 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 want, I want to come. Can I come with you? And, and he came and he stood with us uh, during the ceremony. I went up and said a few words and he stood by my wife. And uh, as he stood there, he wholeheartedly was really into the ceremony. He was really into the spirit of the event. And once I was done, he came up to me and gave me this big hug and said, I love you. Uh, and that was beautiful uh, that we're beginning to have this conversation. And when we look at making things right, for me personally, uh, it was immediate for me uh, because one of my friends who knew the truth. Uh, for one, he's with me. Uh, he's with my wife and my wife is a indigenous rights lawyer. She's amazing. She's wonderful. She's my core. Uh, so he knows a little bit more than, than maybe the average person. But the, the immediacy of that correction of, 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 of the next chapter became so sudden for me. Uh, and it just felt so good uh, to see his reaction but also to see everybody else's reaction close by. Uh, like I said at the beginning, I'll keep saying this again for me, it's so important to have these conversations with our heart, um, as a, with, with our hands down as opposed to our hands up. 
uh, with our with our arms out as opposed to 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 a clenched fist. Um, if we fight, then people get nervous, they get scared. Uh, but it's really really important to have these conversations. It was so wonderful to work with Ram, being so receptive of 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 the of the urgency to change this, to make this right. It was so wonderful to work with this team. And uh, I wonder I wonder if I can pose a question to Jennifer. Uh, of course. The ROM identified some things they wanted to change, but they didn't simply go in and just erase what was there, did they, Jennifer? Can you talk a little bit about that decision and why that was? Right, right, Craig. Thank you. So, so what we're looking at, and I know some of you are looking for a photograph of this, but I, I think um, I think uh, we have a, a link to the article in the chat so you can see the the photograph. So it's this giant tree cookie, and on it are in our were in the 1920s, someone had stenciled onto the tree cookie important dates in in Western history, um, and and one of those dates was that. Columbus discovers America in 1492. So that was the triggering, the, the really problematic um, language that was on there. Um, so the decision in consultation with our indigenous advisory circle was not to erase this or to take the tree cookie off display or to cover up that language, but to keep the language there, but explain how museums and I mean how our thinking has changed and to say that this was this is an this is an artifact from a particular time and from a particular uh, voice and what we're doing now is showing that museums acknowledge that past and those past errors and are now re reinterpreting using the voices incorporating the voices of indigenous people and people with lived experience um, and, and creating a new kind of interpretation that involves these multiple voices and is not just based and rooted in this Eurocentric museum, uh, Western museum uh, way of doing things. Um, so it was important to us that we didn't just erase it, but that we acknowledged that this is what has happened in the past and we are now correcting those mistakes. And we want people to see that journey and be transparent about that for our publics. And so that, that makes me think of what Stan was talking about earlier when he talked about, he mentioned the word capital T, truth, I think. I imagine it with capital T at least. And uh, so basically what we're saying is in the 1920s, when this decision was made, that actually was, it was a mistaken truth, right? Uh, and now we've actually expanded to, to acknowledge, yeah, we were wrong in the past. So Stan, I wonder if you could comment on, on, on those issues, how they relate to truths and, and how the ROM fits in to, to telling the people about truth. The first thing you're going to see when you see that cookie cutout is, is, is the discovery, 1492. And a lot of people that see that, that are now woke, which is so wonderful to live in a culture, and more and more people are becoming woke to all this stuff, which is it's really cool. Not everybody's going to look down at the edition. Oh, there it is. Not everyone's going to see it. So when we see the, the, the cookie cutout, and for the record, cookies... The concept of a cookie is supposed to unite us together. Cookies are beautiful. I love it when I walk into a house and people are cooking cookies. cookies. I, I love it, <laughs> right? I love it. Cookies are beautiful, right? Okay, nothing unites us than warm cookies. Uh, but let's face it, when we see the, the mammoth, beautiful cookie cutout, and we see that people become triggered. It's a triggering feeling. And then when we look down at the small edition, which probably not everybody sees. And when you see the addition, the triggering feeling still there. So when I first saw the cookie cutout, for me, the truth part, the big, huge, even bigger capital T is to have the, the, the truth part the same size or at least the same eye level so people can see it in screenshot or people can see it first before seeing the actual 1492 section of that cookie cutout. To me, that would be the big, huge capital T in italics and everything would be seeing it on the level really big and huge because currently that little section there is maybe three, two, three feet off the ground. So when we see, when we look, we look, we look straight ahead and we see that part first. And there's an easy feeling when we see that part first. 
Yeah, I think that's one of the things we're always worried about at museums is what what things people will read and take seriously and spend most time on and, and what how they will digest the whole museum and all the text. Um, Jennifer, do you want to talk any more about about some of the decisions about how design works in general, or should we move on to a bigger topic of how institutions change and how we can continue these di types of dialogues and uh, for so meaningful just, change? Thanks, Craig and, and Stan, and I'll just I'll just say that making those kinds of decisions about where to put text and how to design is is a very it's it's complicated, right? And so one of the things we did was work with the indigenous advisory circle to try to make those those decisions but there are no absolute right answers to where and how to put these texts um, and so we're continually working with that and trying and, and as Stan has pointed out there's room for improvement and we need to continually look at these things one of the things that we're going to be doing more of at the ROM is to is to evaluate. Once we put something up, we're going to be asking our visitors more often, how is this working for you? What are you taking away from this experience? And as we do that, getting that feedback so that we can make corrections. The museum, a lot of people think about museums as really static places, but what we're trying to do is show that we are changeable, that we are constantly learning. We are learning institutions, but that means we as staff people are continually learning as well. And so we need to engage in this ongoing dialogue with our visitors so that we can um, continue to learn from them and continue to make better installations that will achieve our mission, which is to help people engage with the past, the present, and work together to build a shared future. Yeah, I think there's a lot of trends with, uh, you know, a lot of Euro colonial art, uh, scholars and curators such as myself have have are teach their students, you know, it's okay to just say you don't know, or you're wrong. It's okay, you don't have to have like, one group of people that know everything and, and just assume no one else has anything to contribute. And I think that's still something that we still have to emphasize in the classroom and, and in, the, in the in the curatorial space gallery space as much as possible. So, so you touched upon uh, a bigger topic, uh, sort of thinking about broader change and institutional change and making uh, the ROM a place for everyone. I'm wondering if Stan has thoughts that he wants to share on this uh, or, or Jennifer, uh, because we have to actually start to finish up in the next few minutes to get to the Q&A section. I will say something just really short and sweet. I was just really, really proud. Uh, I'm, I'm a member of ROM. And, and I, I didn't cancel my membership with Ram because of this. I was just really proud to be a member of Ram when Ram says, we're willing to take steps. Let's step and let's journey together. And, and there are other steps to be taken. Uh, I'm just really, really happy that uh, those steps were, uh, were, were, were taken uh, together in the right way. And yes, there are other steps to be taken, but we're moving and to me, that's important. And, and likewise, I'll just add that, you know, we can't be a museum, an effective museum without collaborating with and engaging in conversation, stand with people like you and with others in the in the broader community. Um, and, and, and that kind of conversation, that ongoing conversation is what makes us a better, more effective, more relevant, more meaningful museum. So thank you again. Excellent. So, so we're going to uh, thank you both. Um, uh, this has been great. Uh, so we'll, we'll try to transition into some Q&A. So please feel free to send some questions. Now we have some questions already. This is a very basic question. I think pretty easy to answer. How long did the whole thing take? I think it, my guess was, Stan, do you know when you initially made this uh, realization and, and let the ROM know? You know what, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking here. I'm thinking maybe was it maybe two, three years, Jennifer? Something like that, right? It, it, it took a few years. Yeah, my understanding, I think it was, I think your first um, your first reach out was in, might have even been in 2016. And then the, the changes were made and we had the event in 2019. Excellent, so about three years. And uh, in my experience, that's fast for a museum to change its galleries, believe it, believe it or not. And, and that this just because we have so many working parts. Uh, we're, we're just a huge collective and we all have to get in the same room uh, and try to get things happening. Um, another question here. Of course, the other thing is we had to consult with the Indigenous Advisory Circle. I'm a, I'm a member, I'm lucky to be a member. Uh, I'm not an Indigenous person, but I am a member. And so uh, that does take time because we have to get everyone together, of course. We have seasonal meetings, so it's only four, four times a year. Um, 
the question is about bringing communities together for this project, Jennifer. I don't know if you know enough about this. I'm not sure I know the answer to this one, but uh, in terms of the Northwest work, how did we bring communities together? I know that had a lot to do with Jeanette. And then about the, maybe about the, the, the unveiling, how did we bring different mm -hmm. communities? Yeah, so I know Jeanette played a key role here and she reached out to the folks um, and it, it, where the where the tree where the original tree was from um, and then they helped with the interpretation there was a video that was created and then on the for the event we did the event on one of the evenings where the ROM was open free um, for our visitors in the evening so we had a very large crowd in the build in the building that day and then we had a, a screen on site and we had the the folks from that community who were actually on screen as we were having as Stan was in the gallery talking about what happened um, and they were able to connect with us I, I do remember we had some technical difficulties um, but they 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 were there to join us in sort of unveiling this new way this more accurate way this more fulsome way of interpreting the tree cookie uh, oh, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question about how long the tree cookie has been in the collection. Unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if Jennifer does. And then it says, what year was the original labeling done? And that is the 1920s uh, is the answer to that question. Uh, uh, Jennifer, do you have any idea of how long the tree was around? We're, we're not actually um, yeah. biology so, curators, so it's hard. Right, to right. <laughs> so the tree, well, my understanding was the tree was, uh, was cut down in 1890. So I don't know when it came into the ROM collection, but yes, you're right. The 1920s was when the words were, were printed on that. And if you're asking, if, if someone was asking when the original interpretation happened, that would have been when the Shad Gallery was put in, Craig, before you and me. I yeah. think that was about 15 to 20 years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah by ROM standards, we're so new. Uh, the, the, the tree has been there for a long time, but uh, we're very new. Um, we did have another question about uh, having more information on the, the transformation that we've been talking about. And we do have a link in our chat, or you can actually just go to the ROM website and just search tree cookie and you'll find it. Um, this is a question again, this probably is more uh, aimed towards uh, Jennifer. Are there any other similar projects in the pipeline at the ROM right now? I mean, there's all kinds of great stuff going on in the learning department, I know. Yeah, specifically around um, uh, working with indigenous communities. Is that do you think that's what the question is? Because yeah, um, or or or, or decol decolonizing the museum or something. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So there are a number of things, and I I think I'm gonna. Um, I mean, one of the things that has happened recently and is at top of mind right now is is we're going to be opening an exhibition of work by a contemporary Ethiopian artist named Elias Sime um, in the spring. And one of the things that the Ram has not uh, had a, a strong history in is uh, up until relatively recently is representing global African cultures. And so in presenting the work of this um, contemporary Ethiopian artist, we uh, worked with a number of representatives from the local um, Black communities around Toronto and asked them, as we were in the stages of developing this exhibition, for their input on how we were designing the space. And they gave us feedback. These were people who had lived experience of Ethiopian cultures. They gave us feedback uh, on the design, and we made changes to the design based on that. Um, so we're doing more of that just as when we interpreted the tree cookie, reinterpreted the tree cookie, we're working with members um, uh, of communities from where these, these specimens, these objects, these works of art come from um, in order to interpret them in a way that reflects people who have lived experience of those cultures. Um, so it's somewhat related. I know it's very different. The cultures are very different, but it's a way of working that shows collaboration um, with communities to build in relevance and meaning. Excellent. And, and I can also assure you that uh, Curatorial has many different uh, projects going on. I, I'm, the, I'm the North American archaeologist. I have all kinds of things happening. I do collaborate, collaborative work with Native American people in the US. Uh, we're doing repatriation and things like that as well. Uh, but I have a question for Stan, if you don't mind, Stan, because because we talked a little bit about your background at the beginning. But uh, I don't know if if you've ever done any projects similar to this one in the past, or how this 
project relates to your broader uh, professional identity as someone who, who talks to audiences and, and is a Cree knowledge keeper. So if you could tell us more about your background and how it fits in with a, sort of working with museums and how you see maybe a future there maybe for further collaboration. Well, for one, um, I was a member off the street uh, who, <laughs> who just rolled in one day had a conversation with my beautiful wife and said, you know, our, our, our amazing Tanona loves dinosaurs. Let's, let's, let's go. And then we looked at the package and we're like, it just makes sense for us to get a, you know, a membership, right? Of course. Hello members. And then we just <laughs> kind of rolled in and, 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 and there we were in terms of working with museums in the past, I've never worked with museums. I wouldn't even call this a, a, a work, uh, uh, with the museum. I just say a relationship with some good people. That wanted to make things right. In terms of in terms of my history, my history has always been about okay, how could we bring our shared relationships together uh, in this in this in, in 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 this country so we can so we can live together in in that peace and harmony which was promised initially, is that uh, we were going to live together. Um, so with that spirit for me, it's all been about okay, how could we how could how could you not only understand my story, but I can sit and understand yours. It just has to be a two way street. But in order to do that, we need to be able to understand one another. We need to be able to make things right. And if there's something that needs to be done or misinterpretation, then something has to be said. And then when something has to be said, there has to be a commitment from not just one side, but from both sides to make something right. So what I've been doing for the last 30 years traveling all over the country is beginning to just tell stories about a little bit about my childhood, about sitting in a blind with my father and my dad would begin to tell stories about stuff. And the stories that he told me are the same stories that I tell people about history and people tend to make sense of, of, of your story, Craig. They say, okay, all right, I, I, could, I could see something there that applies to me. And when Jennifer tells a story about, about, about her story, people can, uh, people can understand sections of hers and it can apply to theirs. So there's something beautiful about that shared relationship of stories. Everybody has an amazing story. Yeah. And at the end of the day, that's all that really matters is the story. That's it at the end of the day. But it was important to get the story right. Yeah. Because that, that, cookie, that cookie cutout told a very, very important story and it needed to be corrected, we needed to be honest, then there had to be a promise to make something right. So to me, it was all kind of fitted and it was, it was fitting beautifully into my mission was people work together, pulling different people together to, to make things better in this world. So much more work to be done, but oh, yeah. this one here has been wonderful. Yeah, so excellent, absolutely. Uh, great stuff. So I have a question for both of you, I think. So we have a question from someone who's currently studying museum studies. And she's wondering, uh, or he or she is wondering if you, oh wait, it went away. Okay, if you have advice for how museum staff could be more mindful and proactive for evaluating <laughs> museum exhibits as opposed to just waiting for visitors to tell them that there's an issue. So, uh -huh. so I think both of you might have something to, to contribute to this question uh, in general. Jennifer, go ahead, go, ahead. Yeah. You go first. Uh, okay, thank you, Stan, because I'm sorry, I just like jumped in like, yes, there are, there are many things we can do. <laughs> um, and, and we're doing them as far as like, as I was saying before, engaging with people in the development of exhibitions, engaging with people before they're built and written and put on the wall. So we're talking to people ahead of time and building in that um, collaboration, which then helps ensure that um, and then testing that to see how it's how it's how it's playing out before we actually build. So I'm I'm super enthusiastic about that and and um, um, and looking forward to doing more and more of that. Um, yeah. So Stan, you know, within Toronto and the 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 individual asked that question in these 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 centers. Uh, urban centers or rural, wherever you live in this country, there's a, a community of indigenous peoples living close by. Um, there's a, in Toronto, there's a, an incredible, vibrant, just full of light and beautiful energy uh, of uh, indigenous uh, a community, tens of thousands of amazing indigenous people living in Toronto. 
brings me back to this event that we had just recently in this one elder who was the conference elder on Zoom. He says, you know, whatever question that you have, there's an answer. The person with the answer may not come and seek you out, but if you seek out that answer, we'll be there. If you need an elder, we will be there. We may not be the one knocking at your door, but all you need to do is reach out and ask and we will come. When it comes down to things like this and you're looking for honest answers, you can't just open that door and hope they come in. You need to reach out to the wonderful Native Canadian Center, uh, institutions and, and, and organizations like that and, and, and invite the beautiful elders, invite the members into, the, into your museum and sit them down and say, just what do you think? Let's have a conversation and it's okay to ask. And when we ask, people will show up. If it's done in a good way, people will be there. Excellent, excellent. Um, there's a broad question here, which, which, which uh, well, we'll see how it goes. Are there other objects or displays at the ROM specifically that warrant reinterpretation? I think that's a very big question. Uh, I know Jennifer has been very busy over the last few years with a lot of projects like this. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe give an example of some, some other projects. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, we're constantly looking at that. We're constantly looking through the galleries to see where do we need to make changes. Sometimes our community, sometimes our visitors tell us where we need to make changes. But that is something that we look at every year. I mean, it's part of our process. We, we go through the galleries. What do we need to change? Where is, schol where is scholarship changed? Where is, where, is, uh, where is the interpretation outdated? Um, there are many, I can tell you, there are many, many things that we want to, to take a fresh look at and to, um, and to reinterpret and to redesign galleries. Uh, it all takes money and time and, and we're working on that. But yes, absolutely, it's a continual process. And that's why I think museums are not static, but we need to constantly be saying, our galleries need to be updated to reflect um, our changing ways of engaging with the community. Voices, bringing in other voices from outside of the museum and not just the internal museum voice. So. Absolutely. Um, and I, I thought of another example that's really just really quickly, Craig, um, Stan, that I think your daughter will really like. In November, we're going to be opening our newest permanent gallery, which is the Dawn of Life Gallery, which has our very earliest fossils in it. So even before the dinosaurs. And one of the things that we've done is incorporated quotes from Indigenous uh, knowledge keepers and others about this, this land and these fossils that were found in this land. And that is in threaded throughout this new gallery. And on an audio tour, we will also have um, layered in the voices and perspectives of the indigenous people who've lived on these lands where these fossils were found. So being able to have people see those perspectives and those voices in a gallery that's dedicated to fossils, ancient fossils, is the direction that we're going in. As we build these new galleries, we're going to be taking steps like that. And, and I would add, Jennifer, that in the, in the next few years, we're going to be, uh, we're working right now. I'm working with Kent Monkman. I'm the curator, and Kent Monkman is a Cree artist, and he's doing a project on indigenous knowledge and indigenizing science, and it's going to be absolutely fabulous. It's going to be friendly to all ages, especially young children, to make that impact. And so that's another thing that uh, I'm just so happy to be uh, working at a place like the ROM where I can be involved in some small way with these little projects. Uh, that my part is a small part. Um, so ab ab excellent. I, I see that we don't have that many, we don't have any questions left. So I was wondering, uh, Stan or, or Jennifer or both, do you have any final thoughts that you wanted to share? And then I'll, I'll close this up. I will say this, if, if, you're, if you're off the street and you pop into ROM and you see something, and you want to have a conversation with staff about it, in my experience, take that step, have that conversation. Take that step, have that conversation. There's good people working there. And, and there, there's, so many, there's so many people that just want to have a fight. And I get where that's coming from because there's so many people in this country that it's, it's, it's been wrong for so long. But when it comes down to making things like this right, Let's sit down. Let's have the conversation. It does take time. You may have to ask twice. You may have to remind people, okay, what about this? But there are people there like Craig. 
there are people there like Jennifer and the wonderful Jeanette. Oh my goodness, Jeanette is watching. I love Jeanette. <laughs> that care <laughs> about people that walk through those doors and want to make things right. My goodness, there are good people there. So when you want to make change, we need to find the right people and there's the right people within realm. Well, thank you. Thank you, Stan, for your generosity and for your kind words. And um, I would I would just say to wrap up, you know, again, thank you. Um, I wish we could we could, you know, move quicker than we do. Um, but I will say that there's real commitment from ROM leadership, from ROM staff, from the amazing curators like Craig um, to make these changes. And we are open to these this dialogue. And uh, I'm really looking forward to what the future is gonna bring and how we continue to, to engage in this ongoing conversation. Thank you so much, Stan. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Jeanette at home. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, the Indigenous Advisory Circle and our fabulous colleagues in learning at the ROM. Thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you again for our next curatorial conversation on March 3rd. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank TD for their ongoing support for this program. Details of all upcoming ROM at home online programs can be found on the ROM's website and on our social media channels. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening. <laughs>